Hills and Valleys is a podcast that uncovers stories from leaders in healthcare, tech, and everything in between. Straight from the heart of Silicon Valley, we give you a look at the good, the bad, and the future, one episode at a time. Brought to you by Petro Medical. Hey everyone, Omar M. Khatib, Director of Growth over Petrero Medical, and a quick announcement before we jump to the episode this week. Are you attending the American Hospital Association's Leadership Summit this year, July 24th to 27th, down in sunny San Diego? Well, exciting news is that Petrero Medical will actually have a table there. So come by table number eight, right in front of the main exhibit hall, meet our team, uh, check out our technology, and learn more about the platform that we've built, and more importantly, Imagine how much more powerful and successful your hospital could be knowing some of the biggest economic burdens that other hospitals are facing, and more importantly, how our technology could potentially help you and your clinical team solve for this. So again, come by table number eight at the AHA Leadership Summit this year in July down in San Diego. Now, for the podcast episode this week, we picked a very interesting topic, which is healthcare economics and finance. As you know, most practicing physicians, they have at least a small understanding or functional understanding of the fee-for-service model, which has historically provided their reimbursement. But a lot of rapid and accelerating changes in healthcare finance really mandate a broader understanding of how these funds flow through the system. So at the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists, we actually caught up with Dr. Gordon Morewood uh, to outline how this shifting landscape of healthcare finance uh, looks, and more importantly, how physicians in general can adapt and thrive in it. Now, Dr. Gordon Morewood currently serves as Chair and Professor of Clinical Anesthesiology at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University, and his research interests include pulmonary hypertension in surgical patients, knowledge transfer in graduate medical education, and what he's very well known for among his peers, incentive systems for medical professionals. Now, if you are interested for a deeper dive in this topic, Dr. Morwood wrote a beautiful yet very concise and powerful piece on our blog. You can check that article out by following this link. And that link is bit.ly forward slash healthcare models. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash healthcare model. That's healthcare model, which is singular. Now, on to the show. Hey everyone, this is uh, Omar M. Khatib, Director of Growth over Petro Medical, and we're in Chicago. It's a little rainy today at the Hyde Regency for the Society of uh, Cardiac Anesthesiology, and we're joined by Dr. Uh, Gordon Morwood. Doctor, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So there's a lot of interesting things that I definitely want to cover, but just, you know, for our audience, why don't you tell us a little about yourself. Um, you know, where'd you go to school? Where'd you grow up? Why'd you choose medicine? Sure. Um, originally, I'm from Canada. I grew up in Canada. My parents were both Canadian and uh, went to school there. I actually ended up in medical school. I'm not sure uh, how many of your listeners will this will resonate with, but uh, one of my favorite shows when I was in high school was uh, Frasier. And, uh, and I remember that show. <laughs> I, I, I decided that I wanted to be a psychiatrist. And it was only after that I learned the, uh, decided that I wanted to be a psychiatrist that I learned that you had to go to medical school first to be, become a psychiatrist. So then I thought, all right, I'll go to medical school. Uh, so that's kind of how I ended up on that trajectory. And uh, once I was in medical school, I realized psychiatry really wasn't for me um, and started to pick through different paths. I, I looked at surgery and, and a variety of different uh, disciplines but ultimately decided that I liked the ICU critical care type settings uh, the most and that's how I ended up in anesthesiology. Interesting. You know they say that when you go through medical school you end up choosing the thing that your personality most fits in. Would you agree with that? I think I could probably see that. Yeah, I mean anesthesiology is very detail oriented, it's very task oriented. Um, it's, it's very immediate, you know, you have to have yourself organized and be ready to deal with things in the moment, uh, but you have a relatively short time horizon. So, for example, in medical school where I did rotations in rheumatology, which is, you know, the arthritic type diseases, uh, they put patients on medications and say, come back in six months and we'll see whether you're better. And I said, six months, my God, I'm like... <laughs> I'm not going to remember any of these patients six, six, six months from now. I need satisfaction now, today. So that's uh, that's a large part of anesthesiology. Interesting. And now, you know, cardiac anesthesiology is kind of like its 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 own beast. It's a subspecialty. So, 
What was it about cardiac anesthesiology that got you so interested? Because it's a very sort of high, high emotions, high tense environment because you're dealing with, you know, very big surgeries. What, what got you interested in that? I think your description is accurate. It is a fairly stressful environment. There, it's high stakes and uh, the procedures tend to be fairly complex and you need to be able to, to handle them perfectly every single time. Uh, even small deviations can, can result in disaster. Uh, I think the thing that, that drew me to the subspecialty most was the teamwork between the perfusionists, the nurses, the surgeons, and the anesthesiologists in those particular types of surgical cases. That kind of teamwork exists to some degree in every single operating room, but in the cardiac operating room, it's the most pronounced uh, and has, has historically been sort of the most obvious when you, when you compare it to other settings. Mm -hmm. So I can literally spend six to seven hours uh, with nothing more than a thin paper drape standing shoulder to shoulder with a surgeon as he completes the surgical procedure and I'm providing the anesthetic care that keeps the patient's heart beating and keeps their blood oxygenated while the surgeon is manipulating their heart and everything he does affects everything I do and everything I do affects everything he does uh, and it's that kind of working together with somebody else to perform a very complicated procedure that that's what I really enjoyed. Interesting. Well, where, do you, where did you go to medical school and where did you do uh, residency? So I graduated from medical school at Queen's University which is in Ontario, Canada. Uh, I worked as a GP for a couple of years before deciding to go back to do anesthesiology and at that point went back to do a residency at the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston and followed that with a fellowship in cardiac anesthesia at the University of Pennsylvania. Very nice, very nice. And currently you're faculty over at Temple, correct? I'm at Temple University, yes. Okay, very nice, very nice. Now, when you were in residency, do you have uh, did you have any mentors, uh, you know, that you trained with, or anybody in particular? So you grew up as a kid, you you really admired Fraser. So who who became the Fraser, I guess, in residency? I think there was a, a quite a spectrum of people in my. I, I was fortunate that I. I belong to a relatively small residency program, certainly by Boston standards. I think, I can't remember how many people were in each class, maybe 15 to 20, uh, which means we had a total of maybe 60 residents in the program. And the faculty got to know all of us in each incoming class very quickly. So I was only there a couple of months before everybody knew me by name, and I knew most of the faculty by name uh, immediately. And so I, I, I can't say that I can pick out one particular person amongst them, that would probably be a little unfair, but I think the faculty there, the way they functioned as a team, the way they worked very well together uh, and handled uh, complexity on a daily basis in some very high stress situations uh, was was inspiring. You know, I, I saw that and said, yes, I've definitely picked the right specialty. What was the most memorable thing that you, at least comes to mind coming out of residency that made you who you are today as a physician? The most memorable thing coming out of out of training, so after my fellowship or out of residency? Out of training. You know what, let's just try, yeah, let's go with training. Out sure. of training. Yeah. So yeah, after I finished my fellowship and, and I took my first position, um, you know, I'd already practiced some, uh, I'd already had some independent medical practice. I'd been a GP for a couple of years before I went back to do anesthesiology. So it wasn't, I think I, I faced a lower hurdle than a lot of physicians who are first finishing their training and are first taking on that individual responsibility for patients. But that still is prominent in my, in my mind. You know, the operating room is a very high acuity environment. And so when you, when you are, when you're in training, there's always another level there. Whether you're a resident, then there's a fellow. When you're a fellow, there's an attending. There's always somebody else that you can turn around when you're in trouble and look at and say, okay, now what do I do next? And, and the day that you walk through those doors and you realize there's nobody standing behind you, uh, it's, it's mm. nerve wracking. And it's, to be fair, I think certainly in today's healthcare environment, that's not really true. You know, certainly in our department at, at Temple University, the, the ethos that we try and cultivate is that we very much are part of a, it's a team sport. Anesthesiology is a team sport. And so we have a very low threshold for calling other attendings into the room and asking for second opinions or a second set of hands or a different perspective on a problem. Um, so I think I think it's less so now than, than back in those days. But back in those days, there certainly was a, a, a significant amount of anxiety when you first in your first year or two of practice, just realizing the weight of the responsibility that was on your shoulders. Interesting. Okay. 
Now, I understand that this morning um, you had a talk, but something that's very interesting, because it it's not exactly directly related to cardiac anesthesiology. Can tell us a little bit about the talk that you had and what it entailed? Sure. So my, my, my talk was on healthcare finances, and in particular how healthcare reform is reshaping the system in which physicians work and why they need to understand how that system works. Um, I think physicians naturally tend to focus a little bit when, when it comes to finances, if they think about finances all at all, they tend to focus just on wh what is their reimbursement for the services that they provide. And my message to the physicians that were assembled there was the system is changing in a way that makes it critically important that you understand how funds are flowing through the system because your actions will affect those funds flows and and if you are not understanding how your actions are affecting the rest of the system you're not going to be able to really prove your value to the system and one of my messages this morning was the fee for service <coughs> sorry the fee for service system for physicians is probably going to go away certainly it's going to be minimized but it's probably going to go away where where you get paid for every little consult you do every time you touch a patient you get a fee the new model that is emerging in healthcare today is paying for product rather than process hmm. and so you have to provide patients with an end result, a knee replacement, a recovery from their pneumonia, uh, competent long-term care of their diabetes. Whatever that end result is that they've come to you seeking, you have to deliver that, and then a healthcare system overall will get a bundled payment. Uh, and then the physicians and the nurses and everybody that's involved in that care will, will benefit from those payments. Those payments will get divvied up, not quite on a, not quite on that straight a line, you know, the, the, the income will come to the systems and the systems will pay the healthcare workers that are providing those outcomes. Mm -hmm. but, but physicians under that kind of system then need to understand, you know, if, if your value is normally couched in, did you touch this patient today? Did you put uh, an intravenous catheter in or an arterial line in? Did you intubate them? Did you extubate them? Did you take out their gallbladder? When you think of that as the way your value is defined and now you have to reimagine your value in how did I help the system look after this group of patients, it's a bit of a paradigm shift. Mm. So in terms of shifting a paradigm, we have to you know, obviously start where the status quo is. So I think you and I and everybody who's listening to this podcast knows that healthcare is in a big mess these days. And to put it into perspective, I was reading your paper earlier that was stating that I believe that back in 2012 or 11 that our GDP was about, I think, 16, 16%? It was a little bit lower than that. I think it was about 13 or 14% 13. of GDP went to healthcare. And right now, today, in the year 2019, we're just under 18%. Uh, and a group of economists uh, in the employment of the federal government back in 2009 projected that as early as 2040, a third, so 33% of our GDP could go to health care if we continued on the current trajectory. And I will say that from 2008 until 2019, the projections of those that group of economists, we have followed those projections pretty much exactly. So there's very little to suggest that they were wrong. Interesting. Interesting. And clearly we can't go along that way because putting a third towards healthcare are so many other things that not just this country, any country needs and doing that would be detrimental. You mentioned Stein's Law. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I found that very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I love this story. So Herbert Stein, um, and, and this is a bit of a side sidebar, but... And and we, love, we love sidebars <laughs> on this show, so All go right. ahead. So Herbert Stein. Herbert Stein was this... Uh, a uh, world-famous economist. He was the president of the Council of Economic Advisors for Presidents Nixon and Ford. Um, but the sidebar that I enjoy about him is that his son was actually Ben Stein, who uh, some of your oh, listeners really? may... Oh, Yeah. <laughs> I know Ben Stein. Yeah. From Comedy Central. From Comedy Central. Yeah. His breakout moment. The thing I love about Ben Stein is Ben Stein is actually a... He's a trained lawyer. He's a trained economist. And uh, his 
breakout into acting was actually in the original Ferris Bueller's Day, uh, Day Off, that movie. I don't know if you remember, but he was the teacher, the economy teacher, economy, economist teacher uh, in, in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And uh, it was a friend of his that was making the movie. And they said, hey, we got his bit part for a teacher. Uh, you know, he's an economy teacher and econo uh, economist teacher in uh, high school. You want to come out and, and play the role? And he said, yeah, sure. So he showed up and they said, uh, well, and he said, what do you want me to do? And they said, well, they, we just want you to give a really boring lecture. And he said, okay. And he launched into uh, a lecture about the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, which is actually a real thing. Uh, and so it was one of his economist lectures from his, from his classes that he was teaching at the time. Uh, so if you, if you want a, a, a Harvard uh, or a, an Ivy League uh, lecture on economists, uh, uh, the uh, Hawley Smoot uh, Tariff Act, Go back and watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off because that yeah. is a, that is an honest. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's just it's such a classic piece of like '90s pop culture. Was it oh, the '90s or '80s? It was it was in the '90s. But yeah, being I born think. in the '80s, it was part of that. Yeah. Like Bueller, yeah. Bueller, Bueller. That was him. Yep. So that's Ben Stein. So Herbert Stein was actually his father. And uh, and he, in his own right, was a he was a Nobel winning economist, and so he he worked for Presidents Nixon and Ford. And Stein's law is simply that if something cannot go on forever, it will stop, <laughs> which sounds overly simplistic, but it it is a profound economic truth. And at the time that he said it, he was he was actually a non-interventionalist, and so he was arguing to the presidents that he served that there was no need for overregulation or interference in the markets when markets function appropriately, if something is unsustainable, it, it will be curtailed, it will stop. Interesting. Um, but the, the problem with that theory, although it's probably correct, is that sometimes it's uncomfortable. And the example I gave the audience this morning was, you know, the, pretty much everybody that I could see in, sitting in the audience, I'm reasonably certain, owned a home in 2008. Uh, when we came to the end of an unsustainable trend in housing uh, finance through the through the banks and through the worldwide banking system and when that self-corrected it was uncomfortable for a lot of people yeah and so sometimes when these processes are unsustainable even though it's true that perfectly functioning markets will correct them uh, it's in our best interest to get out ahead of the curve and see if we can start to tweak them or at least see where the crash is going to come and position ourselves so that we're we're well able to cope with them when they occur. Interesting. It sounds like he's a bit of a naturalist because, you know, that, that law, though it applies to economics and markets, sounds like kind of kind of like allowing Mother Nature to take its course, which could be very harsh and chaotic and unforgiving. Well, ec economics, really at their core, are quite Darwinian. Uh, they say, you know, if, if, you have, if you have a perfectly functioning system, it will produce the most efficient uh, results. Now, the most efficient aren't always the kindest or, or, or the ones that are uh, fair to everyone. Fairness and, and efficiency doesn't necessarily go to together, but, but markets will produce efficiency when they're allowed to run on their own, uh, unimpaired. So do you feel that when it comes to healthcare, that Stein's law is something that we should, you know, I guess embrace? Is it, is it, do you, how, how do you feel that Stein's law should be factored in? I think it's, uh, you know, I'm kind of, I'm not emotional about it at all. I think it's just simply a truism. It's like acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second. It's the law of the universe. Now, on the surface of the Earth, that's the acceleration due to gravity. Stein's law says that unsustainable systems will stop. Our healthcare system, when you look at the trajectory it is on, it simply, that won't happen. And it mm -hmm. won't happen because people can't dedicate that number of resources to healthcare. So, by definition, it's going to change. Uh, I don't think that there's any reasonable question that in the future we will not spend less money per patient to provide health care. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my belief is that when done appropriately, we can actually spend less money per patient to provide health care and actually provide better health care to our population overall than we do now. Uh, but there's some hard work that's going to need to be done between here and there. How do you, so how do you do that? So you mentioned that you know, like the fee for service is going to be diminished, and you're mentioning that this is, this is at least your belief. How, how do we get, get there? What, what's the first step? It's already happening. So the first step is to shift away from paying for process and towards paying for product. And so there are, there are a number of companies, so this is where the economy comes back into and it, you know. Real quick, can you, can you tell us, uh, be a little bit more specific, what do you mean by paying for process right. versus being paying for products? So uh, l let, me, let me explain that. So the, the, the quintessential example of this is the experiment conducted starting by, uh, by Walmart starting in 2012 where they established 
centers of excellence for healthcare for their employees. Walmart at that point had 1.5 million U.S. employees, directly employed uh, patients, or sorry, directly employed employees, uh, whose healthcare they covered. Walmart is large enough that they're one of, they're one of the companies that self-insures their population of, of employees. So in other words, rather than paying a, a traditional insurance provider to provide health care coverage for their, patient, for their employees, they simply hire an insurance company to manage the health care insurance uh, products that their, their employees use, but they fund the whole thing. So if they go over the premiums on a given year, it comes out of Walmart's bottom line. If they save money on premiums every year, if their health care spending is actually less than what they take in in premiums, then that flows directly to Walmart's bottom line. So they have a very significant stake in how their how their employees get their health care and how effective it is. So back in 2012, they started their Center of Excellence program, and what that involved was giving all of their employees a choice. They had, they had basically two choices for three specific types of surgical intervention. If you were having cardiac surgery, uh, spine surgery, or transplant surgery, you had the option of either going to your local hospital, wherever it is in the country that you worked for Walmart, you could go to your local hospital, get your traditional care, pay your normal co-pays, and nothing changed. Alternatively, you had the option to going to one of six world-class healthcare centers around the United States. Big famous names that everybody would know. The Cleveland Clinic, the Virginia Mason Clinic in, in Seattle, the Geisinger Healthcare System. Um, you could go to one of these healthcare systems to have your, your health care. They would pay all of your deductibles, so you had no out-of-pocket costs if you went to one of these world-famous centers. They would pay to fly you there. Not only would they pay to fly you there, but they'd pay to fly your significant other there. They would put your significant other up in a hotel while you were there getting all of your health care, and then they would fly you back, both back home. And by doing this, what they found was it was actually less expensive than allowing their patients to get care in their normal local community hospitals. And the reason is, in their local community hospitals, when Walmart paid for their care, they were still paying every for every imaging study, for every physician visit, for every time somebody touched the patient around the time of their cardiac surgery or spinal surgery or transplant surgery. Everything had its own individual bill. And the problem with paying for process is that those organizations have no motivation to innovate, to try and figure out which parts of their care are effective and which have no value and eliminate the ones that have no value. But these centers of excellence, Walmart said to them, we're giving you one lump sum payment. Here's what it's going to be. And the centers looked at that and they said, yeah, we can, can, we can provide this care for that amount of money. And by moving away from paying for the process, but instead paying for the product, now they could examine their own internal processes and say, you know what, we don't really need an MRI in this group of patients to decide whether or not to do surgery, but they would all benefit from you know, visiting with a psychologist before they go to surgery, or whatever the case may be. The point is they were no longer billing for those individual services, so if they eliminated them, they didn't lose revenue because they were still getting a lump sum payment. And they could focus the services that they provided to the patients on those that were the most effective. And the amazing thing is, we now have seven years of experience with these centers of excellence programs through Walmart. And what they've found is, consistently, the patients who fly to these centers of, uh, of, of excellence and have their care there, they have shorter length of stays in the hospital, they have fewer post-operative complications, and their total cost of care is less than getting it in their local hospital. Mm -hmm. So that is what moving away from paying for process to paying for, mm -hmm. for the end product looks like in healthcare. Why do you think that uh, you know moving to these centers of excellence with this lump payment where they're paying for product, what about it do you think influence you know, patient recovery and patient stay you know, to that effect? Sorry, say again. What's like the, the you know? So you mentioned that you know when they when they m implemented the system, yep. right? That patient stays actually shorter and their yep. recovery is better. What what do you think changed? Do you think do you think the medical care was that much better at these places, or because the the process was put under strain where they optimized how they actually treated the patient, and so they weren't going through a lot of you know hoops per se? Right. I think 
I think the medical care wasn't better. I think the system of care was better. Ah, tell me, so, tell us, tell, tell me a little bit more about that. So you say, so the, you say it's the system of care, right? So, you know, under the old system of care, things that that happen that provide revenue that may or may not have provided a lot of value to the patient, you're happy to keep those going because they bring revenue into the hospital. Things that don't provide any revenue but might have a beneficial impact for the for the patient are very difficult to get implemented because there's you know the, the people who are managing the systems look at that and say well that doesn't provide us with any revenue we can't do that so but once you're once you're receiving a lump sum payment for a patient's care you can then go back and say you know what this group of patients here we know that once they get in the hospital for their surgery they're more likely to be here for a longer period of time and suffer some complications if we don't optimize their their serum hemoglobin levels or make sure that their diabetes is very well controlled for six weeks before they come for surgery or to make sure that their asthma is completely controlled before they come into the hospital and it's not that other systems are are intentionally negligent it's not that they look at those things and say ah we don't care uh, but they only have so many resources that they can apply and so they may not have the reach out into the community with all their patients to say it's really important to get these things all sorted out before you come in for surgery. In the center of excellence model, they bring these patients in, they look at them and they say, we're gonna operate on you when we get all of these three things sorted out. And then they help those patients, they coach them. If they're not ready for surgery, they send them back to their communities, they tell their primary care doctors, you gotta do this, this, and this to help us out. Send the patient back when they meet this criteria. Then they come in, now they're, now they're primed for surgery. You know, it's, it's like training, uh, training for a race. If you're gonna run a half marathon, you don't just get up on Saturday morning and say, I'm gonna go run a half marathon, a recipe for disaster. But when you present for surgery, surgery is like running a marathon. And if you hit the hospital not having trained yourself, not having your body in peak condition, you're going to be in trouble halfway through that race when you're in the mm. post-operative period. On the other hand, a little bit of coaching, a little bit of training for a couple of weeks beforehand, we can get you in optimal condition. And that way, when you hit the, hit the operating room, you are ready to go. Your body's ready to undergo that physiological stress, and you're going to sail through the post-operative period. And, and because they're getting a lump sum payment, now nobody's, when they, when they want to divert resources to managing the diabetes or managing the asthma or managing the anemia preoperatively that before didn't pay them well. Now they can look at it and say, well, it doesn't matter. We're not getting paid on each individual component. We're getting this lump sum of money. And we know that if we devote a little bit of money to sorting out all these issues on the front end, we're going to have you go out of the hospital faster and you're going to have fewer post-operative complications. And that's going to save us a lot of money on the back end. And that savings is what we're going to reinvest then in the preoperative period, and we're going to keep that going. Interesting. So by essentially attaching a single price tag, a lump sum to all of this, the hospital is in incentivized to focus on making the system more efficient. Because the more efficient it becomes, they can either divert resources to the areas of the patient's care that they need, and then whatever's left over is obviously profit, correct? Correct. It, and in, in this isn't... This isn't unique to healthcare. This is like any other sector of the economy. If you think, if you go back and look at, pick a variety of products, you know, electronic, uh, electronics, Twinkies. The example I gave this morning was Twinkies. So Twinkies cost when they were first produced. May they rest in peace. May they rest. In, no, but they, I actually, while researching this piece, I realized that the company has come back to life. And Twinkies. How do they really? <laughs> they have uh, a venture capital firm bought them. We need out. to end the podcast <laughs> right now and get some Twinkies. <laughs> So right, we're, yeah. we're heading out for Twinkies. We'll be right back. <laughs> um, yeah, the uh, Twinkies, when they first intro were introduced in uh, 1933, actually in a suburb of Chicago, here, here in Chicago, they, when they were first mass produced, they cost a nickel for two Twinkies. Now, uh, in 2013, when the Hostess Company first went bankrupt, the Twinkies, if you inflate that nickel from 1933, if you inflate that nickel to 2013 prices, it's about $25. Oh my gosh. So that means two Twinkies would have cost you $12.50 each. And at the time, we know that Twinkies were selling for $5 for a box of 10, so 50 cents each. Well, how come a $12.50 Twinkie can be sold for 50 cents? And the reason is that in the intervening 80 years, there was just an enormous amount of innovation that went into how they made the Twinkies, like uh, the process all around it, how they uh, obtained the product, uh, the ingredients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so, innovation, the natural course of innovation, is to drive efficiency. That's what most innovation does. But when you pay for process, you s you freeze innovation. You you freeze it out. You stop it because if you're paying for each individual component of the process. 
the person managing the process has no reason to innovate now. Because if you pluck out one step in the process, well, well, you're getting paid for that. So now you're going to get rid of it. Well, that's decreasing our revenue. Forget it. I'm not going to innovate. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And that's where medicine is stuck. Do you think, so you know, you pointed out something very interesting, kind of an ugly truth in medicine, but do you feel that this is one of the big reasons why physicians are rather conservative and hesitant when new and better technology and tools are introduced? I think, I think physicians as a group tend to be relatively conservative just as part of their culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you, you can trace that right back to Sir William Osler and, and his you know, tenant, do no harm. First, do no harm. Um, and in medicine, one of the basic tenets is you, it's hard to take something back. Uh, mm -hmm. So we tend to adopt new processes, new interventions, relatively slowly and cautiously because you don't want to experiment on people. I mean, to some degree, as we advance medicine, we, ha we have to run experiments on people. That's the only way to figure out what to do it better, how to do things better. But we do that very cautiously. We want bench research first to prove the concept that it might be beneficial. Then we try it in animals and extensively to, to see whether there's any possible benefit there that outweighs the potential risks of changing our processes. And then we slowly introduce it into a small group of human beings just to make sure that there's no unintended consequences that we haven't already taken into account. Because the last thing you want to do, and there, there's, you know, despite our best efforts, there in, are innumerable examples over the years of things that we introduced into modern medicine that we thought would be good and actually turned out to be a disaster, you know, mm. thalidomide. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, about mistakes we've made? No, the, the one you said thalidomide. Thalidomide, yeah, oh, thalidomide. yeah. yeah. So I'm was, not familiar with thalidomide. I'm thalidomide. dating yeah. myself. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> right, uh, thalidomide was... An anti nausea it was actually, um, I believe the class of drug that it belongs to is uh, neuroleptics, so it's a, uh, 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 at certain doses it can be have antipsychotic uh, properties, and if there are any pharmacists uh, listening to this podcast, and I've gotten this totally wrong, please forgive me, it's been a while since I looked up thalidomide, but <laughs> it, it, was, it was this drug that had very specific central nervous system actions, um, but one of its beneficial effects at lower doses is that it also worked as an anti nauseant And back, I believe, in the 1950s, if I have the time frame correctly, uh, 1950s and the 1960s, it was marketed as an effective and safe anti nauseant for pregnant women. Uh, and it seemed to be very effective because uh, morning sickness can be, you know, morning sickness, you think, of, oh, that's a cute name, but it's not cute. <laughs> yeah, so some pregnant women suffer greatly during their pregnancy from, from nausea and severe nausea and vomiting. And it can actually, to the extent that it can actually affect the pregnancy uh, and make their babies unsafe. And so the treatment of nausea during pregnancy is very important. Uh, they introduced this drug thinking that it was safe. And in most pregnancies, it probably was. But what we now understand is that in a small percentage of the pregnancies where the women were exposed to thalidomide during their pregnancy, uh, the, the children were subsequently born with severe limb abnormalities. So absent arms, absent legs, absent hands. Uh, and it took a number of years before people... The thing is, it wasn't 100%. You know, if you, give some, if you get, started giving people thalidomide and everybody that got thalidomide had a baby with a birth defect... You, Hopefully society would pick that up pretty quickly, but it was just intermittent. It was scattered, so it took us a long time to figure what was going on. And obviously in that case then, the, the risks of the drug, the downsides to the drug were vastly worse than the potential benefits, and so we abandoned the drug. And that's just, I mean, that's just the first example that popped into my head, mm -hmm. and I wish that that were the only mistake that medicine had made over the last 50 to 100 years, but it's not even close. We do that not infrequently. Yeah, and I think, unfortunately, that's kind of the, uh, the toll you have to pay when it comes to innovation, right? Yeah, yeah. there is always some risk, yeah. So, you know, let me, uh, one thing that I, I read in your paper that I found very interesting was... You know, so I'm, I'm, a lot of people are going to wonder, like, why anesthesiologists, you know, because a lot of the costs that are being incurred in the healthcare system come from procedure-based, you know, uh, medicines, such as in, the, in surgery and OR. Mm -hmm. So why, why are anesthesiologists, like, uh, I, I guess a good group to start understanding this? I mean, because I, I think I would answer that question by saying we have a front row seat. 
<laughs> and t- tell us a little bit more about that. We so anesthesiology as a specialty uh, is involved in pretty much every aspect of hospital-based care. We are in the critical care units, we're in the operating rooms, we're in the pain clinics, we're in the obstetrical suite, we're in the endoscopy suite where they do your uh, colonoscopies and upper endoscopies, we go to the bronchoscopy suite, we're in radiology, anywhere in the hospital where physicians are performing potentially painful procedures, we're involved. And that, and the scope of that practice is increasing every single year. Um, we, We now, service almost double the number of sites in Temple University Hospital compared to seven years ago. That's how quickly our services are spreading throughout the hospital. So we see all the interventional care, and as you very aptly point out, interventional care tends to be on a, on a per episode basis some of the most resource intense and the most expensive care that we, we provide. And so the potential cost savings from either targeting those interventions more specifically to the people who we know will benefit beyond any question of a doubt or by performing those procedures in a more efficient fashion avoiding complications at all costs making sure that patients are properly prepared for them beforehand etc etc those can achieve enormous cost savings like in in this process you know aside from anesthesiologists how do you see physicians playing an active role in sort of engineering and developing these sort of efficiencies? Because unfortunately, so for me, my, my father was a surgeon. I got to you know, grow up with medicine in the household, and I spent some time in medical school. And one thing that we can all agree on is that because physicians have not been actively involved in things, even if they don't have a plan, someone else ends up having a plan. In that case, it's either lawyers or lobbyists, no offense to them, but again, they're not physicians, and that's usually who ends up controlling and deciding the fate of medicine. So how can physicians play an active role in, in, in developing these sort of efficiencies? Where, where should it all start? The first step is to develop the, the skill set, the knowledge base amongst physicians. Medical school is still focused almost exclusively on the acquisition of an enormous body of biomedical knowledge. They're starting to focus a little bit on human behaviors and interpersonal behaviors. They haven't really adopted a robust curriculum across the United States yet in what, around what I would describe as systems management. Um, and this was fine 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, where most physicians were still working as solo practitioners, dealing with individual disease states on their own because the number of interventions or or medications that they had available to them were relatively finite. Um, But what has happened over the last 20 years is the complexity of the pathways of care that we are trying to deliver has exploded, has become almost unmanageable. Uh, the, The number of physicians that are involved with any one patient admission to hospital has increased exponentially. And so to control those kind of systems, you need to have a management structure in place for the healthcare system that can deal with that kind of complexity. The people best positioned with the greatest understanding of the goals and objectives of the care and the nuances and the potential uh, complications from the care are physicians and yet they don't yet have that mind frame of you're a middle manager. Not only do you need to deal with this individual patient and their issues and understand their disease state, but you need to also understand process management. You need to understand data gathering. You need to understand um, process improvement. How, How do you get the information on a regular basis? How do you assemble a team that has all the skill sets you need to make iterative changes to improve the process? How do you prove that you've improved the process? All those things that are that are second nature to people in many industries across the United States are still very foreign to physicians. And they're not complicated, they're not hard things to learn, but they're not part of our medical training yet. And that's really where, what, what our department is focused on with our residents is we're trying to impart to them an understanding of how they fit into the system and not only how they have a responsibility to their individual patients, but they have a professional responsibility to the healthcare systems overall in which they work to help them manage the systems. And how does that start? Does that start with physicians having, you know, weekly meetings with hospital administration, the nurses, um, and, and hospital staff to figure out like what the process is 
to deliver, say, on a medical product or, or a result of a procedure, and how we can sort of, you know, reduce the number of steps and, and things involved. Or, you know, how what, what's a, what's a good actionable first step for for physicians to take? Right. If I, I mean, it is complicated. But if if I were to boil it right down to the essential elements, is you have to assemble a team of people who can affect the thing that you're trying to change, and that's going to involve almost invariably a group of different physicians from different disciplines. Um, that right there is a struggle because the healthcare system is largely organized around individual disciplines. If you look at our healthcare center, we meet every week as a department of anesthesiology, and the surgeons meet as a department of surgery, and the nurses meet as a department of nursing. And then as soon as our meeting is done at 8 o'clock, we all go off, and none of us work with the other people we just met with. We all go off and work as anesthesiologists and surgeons and nurses in a room as a team, and yet that's not who just had the meeting. So. Yeah, and that's interesting because like, if you talked about this, say, like, uh, for, for, for us coming out of, out, of, out of Silicon Valley and the startup world, you, you can't have a functional company like that right. at all. Right. Imagine, <laughs> imagine Boeing if all the engineers met and all of the marketing people met and all the finance people met and they never talked to each other. It would, it would, it would not it last. It would not work. No. So that's, that's issue number so one. So how did medicine last this long doing this though? Well, because I think because the complexity of what we're trying to achieve even 20 years ago was, was, was orders of magnitude less than what we're trying to do. I mean, we've literally gone from, you know, a go-kart uh, in the 1970s to uh, a pretty nice 10-speed bike in the 1990s to maybe a nice Vespa in the year 2001 to literally a moonshot in 2019. Do you feel like that's because of, you know, the benefit of, I guess, technologies and, say, sensors and predictive health and everything, all this data, which is great, but then it illuminates new things. Maybe, you know, centuries ago when you first looked under a microscope and, and you said, oh, wow, there's actually millions of different organisms that can oh. affect the population. So do you feel like that's happening, but in a digital way? Absolutely. So our technology, our imaging capabilities, our laboratory assays that we have, the targeted pharmaceuticals that we have, our ability to determine genetic differences between patients, all of these technological advancements in the care that we can provide have vastly outstripped our abilities to manage the system that is required to deliver that care. That makes sense. That makes and a we lot are of sense. desperately trying to pay catch up. And and to be honest, only small pockets of, of, of professionals and administrators are even recognizing that that's what the problem is. Uh, but we're getting there now. I think people are becoming more aware of it. And so let's take sort of an optimistic look at this. So let's just say in the next couple of years, let's just say in the, in the next five years, all the physicians, all, all the healthcare professionals, they get on the same page here in the U.S. about moving more towards a system-based approach to focus more on delivering the product rather than the process, right? Let's just say that's established, you know, across 50% of hospitals in the next few years. How much can we decrease the amount of money or the, the amount of GDP spent towards healthcare? You know, you said that by 2040, if we keep going on the track that we're going, we're, we're going to be spending close to a third. So if we implement this across even 50% of, of all hospitals in the next few years, is that, is that even possible? And if so, like, what would, what would it look like after that? So I think if you asked people who are very deeply integrated into the healthcare system, who think about this question a lot, and who are knowledgeable about, about healthcare economics, how much of healthcare spending is currently wasted, I think the generally agreed upon number is somewhere in the 30% range. 30% of the spending, the current spending on healthcare provides no value. It, it, it produces nothing that improves the quality of life or achieves the objectives of the patients who are, after all, the ones who are paying for it. Uh, so I think you could, you could, if done surgically and precisely, you could easily carve out 30% of healthcare spending at the moment and be left with a healthcare system that is no worse. And in fact, if you correctly organized it, you could be left with a healthcare system that is substantially better than what we have now. 
how much of that would be achieved if within 10 years we had 50% of the hospitals paying for product rather than process, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's difficult to estimate, uh, but I actually don't even think it's going to take that long. One of the, one of the data sets that I presented uh, in the talk this morning was around this shift from fee-for-service to, uh, to bundled payments or alternative payments. And the shift is, frankly, remarkable. Uh, I believe eight, the, the, the statistics are 85% of very large employers in the United States who are self-insured now have some form of centers of excellence type programs. Uh, the McKesson Corporation uh, commissioned a study in 2016 where they paid a research agency to go around and interview executives from 115 of the largest ins healthcare insurance companies around the country to get their perspective on what their book of business looked like then and what they projected it was going to look like in the near future. At that point, 50, only 50% 50 of their payments at that point they estimated were pure fee for service. And they believed that by the year 2021, these are the healthcare executives now, they believed that by the year 2021 overall, only 35% of the payments would be pure fee for service across the industry overall. So it's shrinking fast. We are making that transition relatively quickly and a lot faster than most people who are on the front line in the healthcare system understand. Interesting. So let me ask you this, and again, we want to be mindful of your time, and we appreciate you spending time with us. For those, say, who are medical students, residents, is there a resource, a book, something that they can at least, you know, sample for now to sort of get their mind set towards thinking about medicine in this way versus having to wait for the system to change for them to learn it? Yeah, yeah. Uh I get that question a lot from medical students because I, I talk about this stuff with medical students and residents a lot and, and I get that question, is there a book I can read where I can just catch up on all this stuff? Uh, the unfortunate answer is no. You know, I've sort of accumulated and backed into a lot of this understanding over a couple of decades. Um, however, there are two books that I would recommend people read if they want to understand, especially for people who are listening to this podcast who have a background in healthcare who really don't understand anything about business or economics. Uh, the two books that I would recommend you read are Freakonomics, which I think is a wonderful, very accessible introduction to the concept of, of behavioral economics and how to incentivize people appropriately to get the results you want. Uh, and the other book is by Atul Gawande, and I'm embarrassed now. I hope he doesn't listen to this podcast. It was the last book he wrote. I believe I believe it's entitled Being Mortal. Uh, it was the last book that he wrote. If you look up Atul Gawande on Amazon and look for his last publication, you'll find that. And in that, he talks about how the healthcare system has failed to adequately address the needs of patients towards their end of their life. Uh, that is where a, a huge amount of wasted spending goes. We as a healthcare industry focus our efforts entirely on fixing things. And it's simply a fact of life that you reach a point where your biological symptoms systems can't be fixed anymore. They're going to decay and they're going to continue to, continue to decay. There are things that we could do as an industry to make patients more comfortable and to maximize the duration at which they can function at any given level. So in other words, to get the highest quality out of the life that they have left. But one of the points that he makes in his book is that in our rush to fix things and our neglect of optimizing current function, we in many instances shorten life and take away functionality. Uh, there's, there's, there are some wonderful studies in, in end-stage uh, cancer patients where they show that those who pursue the most aggressive forms of surgery and chemotherapy actually have shorter survival times and lower quality of life during that residual time that they have left because they spend all their time in these very aggressive medical therapies. And those patients who are transferred to a system of palliative care where the objective is not to cure the cancer but to minimize their symptoms and maximize their, their functionality, those patients actually live longer and have higher quality of life. Um, and the whole book uh, gives you a sense of where 
that's kind of one very specific example, but it leads you to ponder, okay, where else in healthcare have we somehow brushed aside what should be the ultimate objective of the patient in pursuit of our own objectives to cure disease? Uh, and sometimes I think we, we miss the point. We've, we've forgotten the consumer, as it were, uh, of the healthcare services and are pursuing our objectives uh, perhaps a little selfishly. So those are two books I think that if people wanted to at least sort of start to nibble around the edges and, and get a sense of where we've gone wrong, uh, they may be helpful. Interesting. I, I do have to ask you a slightly controversial question. Again, sure. I know that this is, uh, it has to be taken with a grain of salt, but as a physician who studies these type of systems and models, what are some of the best healthcare systems out there, you know, in the world? Because I know that there's always this comparison of like, this country's healthcare system versus our, but of course every country is different, there's different sizes, different populations, but just pound for pound, who's, who's the reigning healthcare champion right now who, who should be modeled after? Around the globe? Around the globe. Um, I do. I do get a chance to study and and read up on some foreign healthcare systems from time to time. I will not claim any really deep expertise in those areas. The examples that I have come across that I think stand out as being particularly efficient are some of the Nordic countries. Mm -hmm. Their healthcare systems are uh, be just because of the general outlook of the culture there, of the population, where they do value quality of life over quantity of life. They do, co they do value quality of life over income or status, and they have a relatively communal view uh, of, of how society should function. They have publicly funded healthcare systems that are reasonably priced and, and I think effectively focus on delivering care that makes a difference to patients as opposed to just pushing the envelope and trying to fix everything all the time. Got it. Doctor, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Now, a question for those who want to perhaps connect with you, maybe follow you, do you, where can they find you online? Are you active on LinkedIn or Twitter? I, maybe yeah. Snapchat? Yeah, this is embarrassing <laughs> because I was just sitting in a committee meeting earlier today where they were saying we all have to tweet more and I said, geez, I don't have a Twitter account. <laughs> So uh, by the end of today, I promise I will have a Twitter account, which okay. will be Gordon Morwood on Twitter, however that works. We'll put that in the show notes. Okay. Um, uh, if you Googled me at Temple University Healthcare System, you'll find me on the webpage there, and I believe my email address is listed, but if it's not, you can always call the department. I do have a LinkedIn account, uh, and that may be the extent of my social media at the moment, but you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Gordon Morwood as well. Fantastic. Doctor, thank you so much for spending time with us today. You're very welcome. All right.